All right, in this lesson, we're going to look at several topics, including a couple which I've been promising to tell you more about. Those topics are data types and inheritance, sample times and sample rates, rate transitions, and triggered and enabled subsystems. So let's jump right in and get started. Data types and inheritance are something that many beginners don't really think about, but that can become really important under some circumstances. If you've done some programming before, then you've probably encountered this topic, but if you aren't familiar with this, that's okay. A data type determines the characteristics of a value using that data type. For example, the Boolean data type specifies that a signal with that data type can only assume two values. 0 or 1. Other data types may specify the sign, range, and resolution of a signal. Basically, Simulink assigns a default data type to most things, and that data type is usually the 64-bit signed double data type. I'm going to go ahead and open a new model for our discussion today. I'll pull in a constant block from the library browser, open the constant block, and go to the Signal Attributes tab. You'll notice that output data type is among the fields. You'll notice that the field is pre-populated with the text inherit, inherit from constant value. This usually means that the block ends up with a 64-bit double data type. If you hit the drop-down button next to this field, you'll see a list of options for the data type. One of the more common options in the drop-down would be the Boolean data type, which would be used for things like Boolean logic or setting flags to trigger some action. For many simulations, no particular attention needs to be paid to data types. You'll often see a field for the data type in the mask of many Simulink blocks, and when you're just running simulations, you can usually ignore this. However, in certain circumstances, like when you are dealing with a model that you plan to compile to embedded code and run on some embedded hardware, this can become really important. In a case like this, you need to think first of all about the processor. For example, if you are using a 32-bit processor, you should probably use, at most, a 32-bit data type, since the double data type will be inefficient to use since it requires 64 bits. Also, if you are facing memory constraints on your embedded system, it may be in your best interest to try to use smaller 8-bit or 16-bit data types whenever possible, even if you have a 32-bit or 64-bit processor. Data types that require fewer bits take up less space in memory. The downside to this is that you lose resolution, and it takes some effort to set up the signals in your model to use optimal data types. But if you are really struggling with memory constraints on a small embedded system, using smaller data types may be really helpful for you. If you find yourself needing to use a data type other than the double data type, you will want to think about whether that data type should be signed. If you're going to put the data type on a signal that can take either a positive or a negative sign, say you are measuring temperature in degrees Celsius, for example, you will want to be sure to use a signed data type. Examples would include the single int 16 or int 32 data types. If you are working with a signal that cannot be negative, on the other hand, like temperatures in degrees Kelvin, then you should use an unsigned data type. Examples would include the uint 8 or uint 32 data types. You'll notice the fixed ET options near the bottom of the drop-down list. These can be modified as desired. You won't really want to use these if you are simulating a physical system, but they can be ideal if you're creating a model that you intend to compile and run on hardware, and the memory in your hardware is limiting you. You can decide on the range and precision that you need for a signal, determine how many bytes of data you need to support that range and precision, and even define a custom data type name for that data type. MATLAB even has a toolbox to help you with using fixed point numbers. Fixed point numbers need to be handled carefully because things like data type overflow can cause unexpected results in your model. For example, if I select fixed ET1160, I'm specifying with the 1 that I want to sign data type. I'm specifying with the 16 that I want to use a 16-bit data type. And I'm specifying with the 0, there should be 0 bits reserved for the fractional part of the number using this data type. This is a bit of a more advanced topic, so I'm not going to cover it in great detail at this point. But you should be aware that MATLAB and Simulink support a number of standard data types, as well as supporting custom data types. Inheritance is a closely related topic. Inheritance basically means that Simulink blocks inherit their data type from the blocks preceding them. Or in the case of inheriting via backpropagation, they inherit their data type from the blocks following them. To illustrate this, I'll set up a simple model with a constant block populated with a value of 2. Feeding a gain block. Which will feed into a numeric display. Now I'll go to the display menu to signals and ports and select port data types. The model shows everything using the double data type. I'll try this again with the boolean data type. And 
you'll notice that the display shows a 1 even though my constant block has a value of 2. The Boolean data type is limiting me to values of 0 and 1. You'll notice that in each of these cases, the data type displayed after the gain block matched the data type of the constant block providing the signal source. This happened because the gain block inherited the data type of the signal coming into it. It adopted the input signal's data type. Okay, the next thing that I want to talk about are sample times, sample rates, and rate transitions. In discrete time models, you may wish to run different subsystems in the model at different rates. For example, there may be some logic that you wish to run once per second, and some other logic that you want to run every 100 milliseconds. You might want to do this to simulate what would happen in some real-world hardware, which might only perform a particular task every so often. You might also want to use this for a model that you will use to generate embedded code to save on processor overhead. You can run the important and time-sensitive tasks often, and the less important tasks less often. You'll notice that many blocks contain a sample time field and the block's mask. We'll take a look at the mask of the constant block, and you'll see that it has a sample time field as well. By default, it's set to be infinite, and that's fine for most simulations. You can specify the sample rate that you want for your input blocks, and then make sure that the blocks downstream inherit that sample rate. Simulink will let you see the different sample rates in a model by going to the Display menu, selecting sample time, and then selecting colors. Logic in your model will be color-coded differently based on sample rate. We'll try this by feeding our constant block into a rate transition, which is found in the Signal Attributes section of the library browser. We'll direct the output of the rate transition block into the input of a summation block, add it to another constant block, and send the output of the summation into a scope. Now we'll set the second constant block to use a 10 millisecond sample rate. If we then go to the display menu, select sample time, and select colors, the model will update with logic running at different sample rates highlighted with a different color. This feature is really helpful for seeing if everything is as you expect it to be. Sometimes you will want to pass a signal between two different subsystems in Simulink. In this case, the rate transition block is your friend. It will handle the rate transition between two different rates, and it gives you a number of options for how you want that rate transition to happen. Our next topic today is triggered and enabled subsystems. You can find these in the library browser under ports and subsystems. Sometimes you want logic to happen only momentarily, for example, on a rising edge. If you've done some programming of microcontrollers or PLCs in the past, for example, you can probably think of some cases where you have used this kind of functionality. Triggered subsystems basically allow you to perform an action only once, when something changes. You can define whether you want the logic in that subsystem to happen on a falling edge with a decreasing value or on a rising edge with an increasing value. Enabled subsystems are very similar, but the logic inside of them continues to run whenever the flag that triggers them is true. This is helpful for the case in which you want something to happen whenever a particular condition is true. Simulink also allows you to handle this in a number of other ways, like with if statements and with switches. Thanks for following along today as we've addressed some important topics. We'll revisit a bit of this material in upcoming sessions. See you next time.